We've looked at that uh, first reading and discussed with it the whole mystery of vicarious suffering and the foundation for that, and that we make una persona mystica with Christ. Uh, now, we're going to just meditate on the psalm that the Church uses for this Good Friday every year. Following on what we've just read from the servant song, we have Psalm 31. There's a line in that psalm which our Lord uh, quotes and is remembered and recorded by St. Luke. Uh, so the psalm says, you see, uh, In you, Adonai, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Now, I must point out before I go on uh, that that line is is in our missal. Then there's uh, four lines that are, in other words, it's heavily edited uh, to get the drift of it, but I think they're concerned about time as well. Um, let's see, the whole psalm has got 24 verses. So, in you, Adonai, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your saving justice, deliver me. And then, the man who's being persecuted, and that's why it's here, uh, goes on, uh, Turn your ear to me, make haste. Be for me a rock fastness, a fortified citadel to save me. You are my rock, my rampart. True to your name, uh, lead me and guide me. Uh, uh, okay. And then, draw me out of the net they have spread for me, for you are my refuge. You see this man is in being trapped by his enemies. Here comes the line now. Into your hands I commit my spirit. By you I have been redeemed, the God of truth. And that is, is in Luke's account of the Passion, if you remember that line. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Uh, in other words, the suffering just man is uh, quintessentially and ineffably realized in Jesus. And so, uh, among the things he was praying from the, the cross was certainly Psalm 22, but also Psalm 31. You hate those who serve useless idols. That's not anything on, I'm, I'm just helping you get the drift of the psalm. And then we'll, as we're looking at the, uh, the actual texts that, uh, are in the Missal. I will delight and rejoice in your faithful love. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I will delight in your faithful love. You who have seen my misery and witnessed the miseries of my soul, have not handed me over to the enemy, but have given me freedom to roam at large. Take pity on me, Adonai, for I am in trouble. Vexation is gnawing away my eyes, my soul deep within me. And he goes on. Now, the next part that the church uses at the liturgy is in verse 11. The sheer number of my enemies makes me contemptible, loathsome to my neighbors, and my friends shrink from me in horror. When people see me in the street, they take to their heels. I have no more place in their hearts than a corpse or something lost. Think of Jesus in his suffering. Back in Jerusalem, it's business as usual. People are buying and selling and arguing over prices and having their lunch and doing whatever they want. Well, probably not having their lunch. They're getting ready to celebrate the Pesach. But they're getting ready to celebrate Pesach. And Jesus is here. 
And these words, inspired words of the song, are trying to give us a, a, um, a vision for uh, what he's suffering. Uh, then, the next text that they um, uh, use in our song says literally, and I uh, batachti. I place all my hope, my trust, batach, uh, your servant. See, uh, it says, Ba'ani alecha batachti. Adonai, um, I say you are my God. You are my God. You are my Father. Um, and then the next line is translated, um, and it's in the missal. You see, uh, every moment of my life is in your hands. Rescue me from the clutches of my foes who pursue me. Think of the number of times that Jesus, praying, said this psalm to the Father, knowing how one day it would be so terrifyingly true of him as he hung on the cross. This is a passion song. And it's picked because on the cross, in Luke's Gospel, he prays, Psalm 5, uh, verse 5. Then, let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your love. You see, Alba Visham, Yavasur Shayam. You see, and uh, snatch me away from my enemies, okay? Let your face shine on your servant. Um, these are all written by people who, moved by the Holy Spirit, are sharing in the sufferings of Christ in an anticipated way. Uh, let your face shine on your servant and save me in your faithful love. Uh, uh, and then... Uh, he goes on now. I call on you, Adonai. This is not in the, the missal. So let disgrace fall not on me, but on the wicked. Let them go down to Sheol in silence, muzzles on their lying mouths, which speak arrogantly against the upright and proud and contempt. And then, again, not in the missal, not in the liturgy, but in the psalm, Adonai, what quantities of good things you have in store for those who fear you and bestow on those who make you their heritage for all humanity to see. What these lines reveal is the confidence of Christ already participated in in a way that's anticipated uh, in this uh, holy man. You see? Uh, what quantities of good things you have in store for those who fear you. Jesus prayed this to his Father. Uh, then the psalm ends uh, in verse 27 saying uh, I'm sorry, not verse 27, verse 24. Love. Ahavu et Adonai. All you devout ones, your chasidim, uh, you see, uh, you're faithful. Adonai protects his loyal servants. Huh? This is all in our Lord's heart, you see. Uh, and then, uh, love him. And then finally, the last line, be brave, take heart, chazaku v'yagnes uh all who put your hope in Yahweh. Now those words, those are commissioning words, the last line of the psalm. Um, Hazakwa Hamas, be brave, be strong and steadfast. That's the way Moses commissions Joshua. That's the way David commissions Solomon to build the temple. Hazakwa Hamas, be strong and steadfast. And here, you see it says, let your heart 
be strong and steadfast, all you who put your hope in the Lord. So here's this suffering man uh, proclaiming the trustworthiness of the Lord. And that's why uh, taking their uh, indication from the fact that Luke records our Lord praying the psalm, uh, at least citing it, how much of it, we don't know that he actually said. But uh, uh, this psalm is uh, then, you see, follows what we've been reading. And then we finally have uh, the second reading, uh, which is followed by the gospel. And this is uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Um, I want to talk about this a little bit before we actually uh, look at the text. There is this uh, tradition of the suffering of Jesus in the garden. Uh, he sweat blood, according to Luke, when he looked upon what was coming. The Lord said to somebody one day, when I was in the garden and I saw what was coming on me, I was filled with revulsion. His whole human nature revolted against this. And uh, in Luke, he sweated blood. And so, uh, this is why uh, this uh, part of this, the, uh, the text, you see, um, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. There's nothing that we are suffering that he doesn't understand, that he hasn't lived through. In fact, um, Pope John Paul II uh, once in a while refers to what he calls a new and divine suffering or a new and divine holiness. And he means how many of the saints of our day have participated in a very remarkable way in the interior sufferings of Jesus. And they know these sufferings. We have some who, even in their uh, having the stigmata, but there are others, many others, uh, some blessed, some canonized, who know what it means to suffer interiorly as Jesus did, particularly in the agony in the garden. And so we have here, in this letter to the Hebrews, you see, uh, the, uh, the account of that suffering. He does not have the account of Gethsemane. But he's talking about that. Therefore, and I'm going to look at the text now, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, our belief. Jesus is the living, eternal, eternal Son of God who in his humanity has suffered untold sufferings to free us from sin and to give us eternal life. That's our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way and yet without sin. Tested, 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 but without sin. He never slipped a split second in all that suffering and mockery, ridicule, pain. He stood steadfast with the Father. And that's why we're saved. As St. Maximus the Confessor says, we are saved by the human decision of a divine person. And that's what this text is telling us, you see. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. And now he begins to recount this uh, moment. Uh probably the agony in the garden, uh, but it may have been throughout the whole of his passion. In the days when he was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Okay? Now, 
the uh, the high priest offers uh, you know uh, gifts and offerings. Jesus offers loud cries and tears. Our Lord God, the living eternal Son of God, is crying out to the Father. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Why have you forsaken me? And yet at the same time, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. I will make your name, you know, known throughout the world. I will tell the world how how faithful you are. And I want to tell you that, Father, even in the midst of my suffering, you see. So in the days when he was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears at the garden at other times. We have that magnificent text in uh, John 12. Uh, I'm just going to have to recite it from memory because we don't have time to go look it up, I don't think. Uh, Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, Father, glorify your name. And the voice comes back, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it. That's that same moment of crisis as it's recorded in John. Um, this was a real crisis, you see. To the one who was able to save him, he, save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. He was raised from the dead. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who believe in him, who obey him, rather. Isn't that amazing that the Son of God could learn obedience? Feel it in his flesh. Obedience costs. And so it cost him in his flesh. He learned obedience in his submission to the Father in an incredible act of love and trust. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And here in this text, you see, this... uh, this introduction to the passion narrative which we have on Good Friday is about this moment of crisis as the letter to the Hebrews records it. In the other passion narratives we have it as uh, the synoptics record it. But here, you see, he was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence but his reverence was, as the Greek text implies, you see, uh, Evlavias, uh, his reverence submission. He was heard because he was raised from the dead. The Father heard that prayer, raised him from the dead, and so now that he's been made perfect, arrived at the goal of his whole existence, his human existence as a divine person, He became the source of eternal life, eternal salvation for all who obey him. So if we obey Jesus, he is the source of our eternal salvation. And by his stripes, we are healed. That's what the church wants us to meditate on uh, as we get ready to listen to the whole account of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. How he wrestled, and in a totally free will act, obeyed the Father, and gave himself up to death. Amen.